Hello, everybody. Uh, this is building on ramps to open source for non technical contributors. Um, hello, my name is Celeste Horgan. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Uh, I'm a developer educator on Ivan's uh, developer relations team, and we are a um, open source data streaming um, and database company. We do that as a service for you if you don't want to deal with your own. Um, my investment in open source is uh, prior to working at Ivan, I worked at uh, the Linux Foundation on their Cloud Native Computing Foundation projects for about two years, um, helping projects large and small uh, with their documentation, developer experience, and effectively how do we do the hard parts of open source. Um, so I got into open source because I was always interested in it. Uh, I thought the idea of the, like an open source um, operating system like Linux was just like the coolest thing ever when I encountered it as a teenager. And I was kind of always looking for an opportunity in my career to get into it because I just thought it was so cool that so many people could come together um, somewhat randomly uh, and make something that actually works and has actual utility. So um, my entry into open source wasn't super normal in that I had kind of direct sponsorship from the Linux Foundation to do the work that I'm doing. Um, very much not the standard for open source contributors. Um, but I stuck around, and now it's kind of a defining career thing for me where I only really like to work for companies that have heavy investments in open source. And hi, everyone. My name is Natalie Vlatko. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, also. Um, and I'm currently fun employed. Um, uh, up until recently, I was the senior software engineering manager and head of the open source program office at Wayfair. Um, and uh, we were a team of engineers that basically uh, shaped the open source strategy and general project work that we were doing upstream, specifically in cloud native. Um, and I'm also currently the co-chair for the special interest group of documentation for the Kubernetes project. I share that um, role with many other the um, folks Ray Lahano and Divya Mohan as well. Um, and I'm also sometimes involved in the authorization um, special interest group as well as part of the Kubernetes project. Um, uh, we're doing intros on how we got into open source. Um, I am um, aging myself right now, but I grew up with GeoCities, if anyone um, out there knows that. Um, and so a lot of my um, getting into open source was actually a lot of it through um, you know, web development um, and generally being interested in wanting to tinker in various projects. I got introduced to some folks in Kubernetes and was able to um, start being involved this way. Um, there was a really cool bug triage project that I helped out with Sigorth to actually help them get organized in terms of what should you be prioritizing and working on in terms of their authorization work? And um, that really got me started in the Kubernetes world. Uh, it's also something that um, in terms of being able to choose to explore deeper, it will, we'll go into this later, but something where open source uh, for me was something that I could kind of choose to come and go as I please as long as I'm communicating that, that intent. Um, and so this is something that I found really um, uh, um, inspiring in terms of like how I could use that um, to my advantage in terms of what was going on in my life and my employment at the moment as I take the summer off. Um, all right. <laughs> Um, and so our talk, as you may know, is um, uh, specifically focused on non-code um, contributors, uh, given that uh, Celeste and I are two of those. Uh, I sometimes code, but I'm a manager now, so we know that doesn't happen anymore. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and, so, um, and so with that, um, we wanted to focus on specifically why we think non-code contributors are so great. Um, in this specific uh, graphic that you can see on the screen, um, we lifted this from Tidelift, um, their maintainer survey. Um, the top three of um, in the question of what do you need the most help with in your project, the top three are docs. They are uh, the user and contributor experience, and they are also um, specifically triaging in terms of like issues and PRs and general road mapping of what you should be working on. Um, and the reason that we think non-code contributors rock is those are three things that non-code contributors can help you with today, right now, in your projects, in the work that you're doing. And it's something that um, hopefully throughout the rest of this talk we're going to help you understand how you can define and open up to getting those um, non-code contributors coming in and helping your project uh, work on things where you're using your time impactfully and they're able to get that intro into open source that they so desperately are looking for. So luckily for you, luckily for you um, we are both of the opinion that it's easier now than ever to be a non-code contributor. So um, I had some lovely conversations with some old school Apache uh, committers. Sorry for calling you old school, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but some older sort of contributors to open source. Um, and when you look at sort of traditional open source contribution methods, it's very mailing list focused. Uh, there's a lot of like really arcane version control systems. And if you aren't like a really 
dedicated developer. It's really hard to break into. It's very arcane. Um, and that's not really the case anymore. And I think one of the ways in which the Kubernetes project was so successful was adopting modern communication techniques. Um, it's easier than ever to be synchronous with people across global and distributed teams using things like Slack and video calls. Um, it's easier than ever to collaborate on software in the open with places like GitLab and GitHub being so readily available and readily free. Um, so now is your opportunity, I guess is what I'm saying. And there's no reason to sort of cling to old methodologies um, in 2023. So let's talk about it. Um, how do you get people involved uh, if they aren't developers? So I mentioned this a little bit earlier in terms of uh, defining help and generally how you get people involved is being willing to accept the help is really the key here. Um, and that willingness needs to actually come with intent and communication. And so what we wanted to really um, underline here in this kind of prerequisite step is that um, uh, in a project, you need to kind of own that non-code contributions are worthwhile and they're worthwhile of giving someone autonomy and ownership over those contributions as well. If we treat project management, meetings, you know, note taking, all the things that aren't code as like, you know, you know second best, um, then it's going to be really hard to get um, worthwhile con contributors and worthwhile contributions around those parts into your project. Um, and so autonomy and ownership is, is, is really super key. Um, uh, Celeste will go over this a little bit later, but there's um, probably a lot of things in your project you hate doing. That's going to be a really great uh, marker of things that you can likely give away. Um, and so for project maintainers, we wanted to highlight that accepting help and and as I've underlined, defining where you need it is really going to be really important. This idea of contributions welcome and then there's like silence because no one knows where they should start contributing or where they can start to help can kind of always uh, catch you in terms of that contribution life cycle. So defining where you need it is really, really key here. Being open to changing processes or ownership groups once those contributions come in so that you can uh, get that contribution life cycle kick started and onboarding people. We will go into this a little bit later, but onboarding is super important. Um, it, it, the, the definition of that is going to be completely up to you, depending on your projects and scope. Um, but onboarding, even if it's just an introductory meeting, it will work wonders. In terms of new contributors uh, out there, uh, number one is you need to be making your own role. You're not going to get everything spoon-fed to you, as you just heard. We are just telling maintainers how to even help you in the first place. So uh, really m being open to uh, making your own role and dealing with processes that aren't designed for you is going to be something that uh, you should come in uh, expecting, but also being willing to learn. Learn not necessarily specifically the ins and outs of um, the project, which is kind of the first part, but more so learning about how you're working with others, how these certain maintainers' uh, kind of communication hours work and how they best want to communicate with you and vice versa. Little things like that are going to make collaboration really successful. Thank you. So I'm realizing that we maybe didn't make this clear in our introduction, so I'm going to step back for a second. Um, Natalie and I, as you may have intuited, uh, both met and were large contributors to the Kubernetes project, which is a fairly large open source project within the Linux Foundation. And those two pieces of framing are key. Um, especially as we get into this next slide of onboarding to people to open source. So something that I noticed um, very often when working with CNCF community projects and with um, Kubernetes specifically is that it's not necessarily the work of the project that's hard. Um, particularly for people who work in software, when you really get down to it, it's making software and we've all done that and we all sort of kind of know how to do it. <laughs> Um, one of the hardest parts is onboarding to open source itself. Um, enterprise collaboration and the ways you work in an enterprise software team do not equal the ways that you work and collaborate in open source. Um, the biggest one I can think of is that approvals and escalations are very, very different. Um, they're typically made by consensus and very often by lazy consensus. So if nobody says no, we're going to do it this way. Um, another example of that is that decision making is different. Um, typically when you're working in enterprise, you can kind of escalate up the chain if nobody knows what they're doing. Um, and the unfortunate reality of open source, but also the deep freeing reality of open source is that the escalation point is you. <laughs> um, and you kind of need to figure out what you want to do on your own. Um, so the most important piece of advice that I have for onboarding non-technical contributors is that you would need to reframe how they work. 
um, more, so, more so than software engineers, I think, because I think software engineers come in expecting it to be a little bit different. But when you're talking about program managers or product managers or documentation people, um, the idea of not having an escalation path is really, really hard to wrap your head around until you experience it. So setting aside some basics of how open source works is super important. Um, second point, everybody in open source is a community manager on top of the other thing that they do. Um, and I think this is the other sort of key point to underscore about open source collaboration is there's always a community management aspect of it and developing those skills is really important because you are ultimately interfacing with random people on the internet. Um, and that requires a certain level of people skills that you simply won't acquire otherwise. Oh, this one's awesome me. So <laughs> on that note, uh, one of the best ways that we like is writing the contribution docs. This is super, super important. Uh, and this was the most common piece of advice I gave to the CNCF's 144 projects, which is if you don't tell people where and how to get involved, they will not show up because they will not know where to go. <laughs> uh, it seems really obvious. It is not every single project I work with I gave this piece of advice. Um, public communications. Where are they? How are you doing it? At the CNCF, it was very common to have open community meetings via Slack or via um, Zoom. Uh, the Apache Foundation does most of its work via mailing lists. Um, how do decisions get made? So for example, if you need lazy consensus on something, the idea that if no objections happen, we're going to go in a certain path, how many days does it take you to get lazy consensus? What happens if somebody does raise an objection? At what point does an objection become a blocking or non-blocking concern? You need to write these things down or else you will get nothing done. Um, who can propose new things or work on existing proposals? How do they propose new things? Um, I think most projects these days, particularly larger ones, have settled on the idea of an enhancement proposal. Um, but again, writing these things down because a lot of smaller projects tend to use issues or GitHub discussions. Um, but if I don't know to look in GitHub discussions, I will simply never click it on any project ever, despite having worked in open source and understanding that people do it. Make it very obvious for people. Um, the second is documenting role titles is really important, particularly as a project gets larger. Um, so I think that the uh, special interest group for release engineering in Kubernetes has done a fantastic job of this. Um, they document every single person that they need to get a release out. They document what that person is supposed to do at what points during the release cycle. Um, and this way, one, it's not dependent on an actual physical human being. It's dependent on a human being to fill the role. Two, because it's dependent on a human being to fill the role, that means that there's more opportunity for different kinds of people to get involved. Um, for past release cycles, we've actually had a lot of students fill these roles, and it's been fantastic for them, it's been fantastic for us. But you have to do the work. It's a lot of work to write this document. But you have to do it, and if you do, they will come. Another area that you can get Nodcode contributors to help you is with all the stuff that you hate, as I like to call project management. Um, basically, your project, um, depending on the size, and, and, and naturally, as Celeste mentioned, uh, she and I have a lot of uh, work and are still involved in Kubernetes quite a lot. And so this large amount of project management in terms of meetings and deliverables is something that we get specific people to help with. Um, process improvements is another area, as well as moderation and community. Those are all areas that we can kind of group under this project project management idea of someone else can own that. Someone else can take that off of your hands so that you can use um, your time in the most impactful way, which is gen generally the message that we're trying to kind of push a lot in, in this talk. Um, it's okay to suck at project management, um, especially when in the teams that I lead. I try and take that job away from my engineers as much as possible, unless they happen to be better than me. Highly doubtful. But uh, that's the thing I try and take away from them so that they can actually use their time better, which is building the stuff that we need to build. Um, and so generally, what we want to do is thinking about that. Give away the rest of what you don't need. It's OK not to own everything. In fact, owning uh, own, ownership should be shared. That's really the goal of open source. Um, but at the same time, we mentioned a lot of how um, working in enterprise can be a bit different. But this is the way that we can think about it in a way that helps us in open source. Think about your enterprise team roles, and can that be replicated in your project? You have product managers, project managers, et cetera. Can you replicate those 
kinds of roles or, or that kind of work and accountability in your project too, to be able to divvy up the work and share the load. Um, that's something that uh, non-code contributors absolutely would love to help you with if you define and let them know that you want that. Next up, buddy up. Um, I think a lot of the hard part of open source, and it's funny because this speaks to a conversation I had earlier today, is the fact that it's really hard to transfer leadership skills. Um, and one of the most successful ways that I've seen that done is if a project is sufficiently large enough, a buddy or a mentoring system. Um, I think particularly for the non-code parts of of project management, the things like bug triage, the things like how, how to decide whether things get done, things like conflict management. Um, having an actual one-to-one -one mentor who will give you actual FaceTime or an actual phone call is about as good as it gets. There's simply things you cannot transmit in documentation, and I say this as a lifelong documentarian. Um, Asking the maintainer or the owner of a project in a smaller project um, questions can be really scary because people can intuit very easily that this is somebody who does not have a lot of free time. Uh, and most people try not to be annoying. They try not to be annoying, which means that they try not to ask those questions. And if you have the opportunity to pair with somebody who is not that key maintainer uh, and bother them instead, most people feel like that's a far less intimidating way to ask questions. Um, the other aspect is people form at least one strong relationship in the project, and if you plan to make a career out of open source, having relationships is really key. Um, as an example of that, uh, Natalie and I met because I was her mentor in the Kubernetes project, and now she leads SigDoc, so I don't think I had a lot to do with it. I think it's all Natalie, but you know, now we're here. So, <laughs> Yeah, thanks, buddy. Um, uh, <laughs> um, Another area in terms of like thinking about non-code contributors and what you can do to help um, help them be impactful is for yourself in the project being flexible to project and general your own ruling change. Um, a lot, a lot of the time, your processes that you're thinking about at the start of your project may not scale with your project itself, and you have to be flexible and open to opening that up with new contributors, non-code contributors, or just the size of your project and how big it's getting, or how much attention it's getting, which is another area too. And so, a good example of this um, in the Kubernetes project, we will be referencing this a lot, obviously, because we work in it very actively, um, but uh, in the Kubernetes project, uh, in order to have um, the permissions needed to LGTM a PR, we want you to be a member of the Kubernetes organization, so you've got to show that you've contributed. A minimum five PRs or some kind of really impactful contribution path that you've en um, endeavored to achieve, maybe being part of the release team for the three releases we have each year, um, but we ask for you to show that, show that membership and that consistency and commitment so that you get those privileges. Um, but that's not going to work every time. We, uh, we organize a contributor summit where we want to get our contributors together in the same room twice a year at the Kubernetes. Con cloud native cons that happen in Europe and North America, um, and making the volunteers of that summit also be members sometimes isn't a great way to introduce new people to the project and to that specific event. So we have to sometimes be flexible, um, and that's something that we're open to. Um, another thing, uh, specifically in SIG Docs that we do, we um, let folks retire and unretire from their contribution paths. We have um, a title of emeritus in the K Kubernetes project where you can basically step down from your tech lead or your co-chair role because we are humans that have lives outside of these projects and our work. And sometimes you don't have the time or the spoons to give to that work anymore. So being able to step down, hopefully with a succession plan and people to take over that work, um, and then being able to possibly also come back when you do have the time. And, and this is where we are flexible with that organization membership. We say, oh, you don't have to prove yourself again. You've, you've done it before and we believe you now and you can come back and take on a role as a contributor. Um, Finally, I enhanced my proposals, proposals were already mentioned by Celeste, but um, being able to have change requests come through um, that are beyond co code improvements, the enhancement proposal process was itself a proposal as, as, as a process to have in rather than just saying, hey, let's build this feature, this sounds cool. Um, and actually have it go through uh, rigorous, uh, like, you know, looking over a reviewership and actual documentation and writing up what the feature will do, who will impact, who will use it, et cetera. Um, and so this is something that, again, those requests coming in, being, being flexible to those requests for your project, big or small, will make a huge, huge difference. So what are the benefits of everything that we've just discussed? Uh, hopefully um, you've been able to uh, have a look at, okay, certain things that we're suggesting this makes sense, this is possibly really good, but what's in it for me? 
First things first, less toil. Uh, so this is another graphic from the Tidelift 2021 Maintainer Survey, which is a fantastic read if you're like a weird open source head. Um, the point that I want to make is that the, ma the vast majority of what project maintainers do, particularly in sort of large projects that are owned by the Apache or the Linux Foundation, is not code. Um, the, it's a pretty small component of what they do. Um, but if you can find a way to welcome non-code contributors into your heart and into your project, um, those are things that they can do and that they might be better than you at doing. Um, more device contributor types basically means less toil, which means that you actually get to do more time writing, writing the software. Um, if you don't like taking meeting notes, somebody is happy to do that, and that is a fantastic new contributor thing to do. Uh, do you not like organizing events? Amazing. There are tons of people in the world who really like doing this kind of stuff. That's why we're here at Berlin Buzzwords. Do you, if you don't like doing docs, amazing. There's entire professions that do nothing but write documentation and give talks and do informative things. Um, and they like doing it, and they might be better at you than it. So if you can find a way to give them the chance, it usually works out pretty well. Another big plus for some of these things that we're listening in terms of non-code contributions is more stability for your project. Stability means you're going to have more trust and thus you're going to be actually having more exposure and, and taking on more users and thus hopefully that means more contributors to your project or generally being able to scale in the ways that you're planning via your roadmap. Um, stability is really important, especially with bigger, with bigger companies who possibly want to take on your work as something they want to plug into their already large ecosystem of open source projects they're adopting. Um, that stability factor is going to get you a lot more exposure, which is really great, um, but it's also hopefully going to harden the parts of the project that need hardening, um, and a lot of that is also the non-code aspect. Uh, something else we want to talk about in terms of more stability, those getting more contributors means that hopefully you as a maintainer, often in open source, there's a lot of sole maintainership and you're kind of flying the flag on your own, um, but you be need, to, need to watch out for burnout. It's quite a huge uh, problem in the open source uh, um, atmosphere generally, um, and it's something that uh, you don't have to actually actively go out and do things alone. Uh, open source is meant to be about community and global um, in, in its footprint, um, and so we do want to make sure that uh, folks are watching out for burnout and you're opening the door to those contributors to help with that. If you're overburdened, your project will suffer. It's it's the be all and end all. Um, if it's completely on you, um, and then like one single straw on the camel's back, so to speak, is all that it needs to have it to come tumbling down. So share the load, whatever that is. Again, defining what it is to share it out, really, really important to the stability of your project. And then finally, the stability aspect actually means that your variety of contributions that you're inviting in means a variety of organizations adopting or putting focus on your project, which gives that more credibility and stability aspects to it as well. Um, and when we talk about um, um, variety of orgs, we're not just talking about necessarily enterprise companies, but foundations, for example, as well. Uh, specifically with Wayfair, we have a, uh, they have, should I say, a project called Tremor, uh, a, a real-time data system where uh, basically you're getting information that you can for um, groups that maybe are e-commerce to be able to triage uh, security issues ASAP with real-time data, um, written in Rust, very, very cool. Um, but this way, this growing of contributions in terms of non-code was a way that we could get um, the CNCF's attention in terms of getting that project into the sandbox there. And that's something that it was such a huge achievement for us, for us in the Tremor project um, that we're still pushing to this day where we opened up the contributions for docs, we opened up the contributions for a lot of the community events, we were able to organize uh, really, really cool conferences around it. Um, and that was actually the way that the CNCF knocked on our door and said, hey, are you interested in applying for sandbox work here? Um, so that's that stability aspect. is is, is a, It's absolutely played out in the open before and it played out in, in our experience. Um, and it's only something that I can further recommend if you're interested in getting a lot more eyes on your work. And then the final thing um, that we'll mention for this talk, but not the final um, uh, benefit of what, you, what this law give you, is more diversity for your project. Um, uh, diverse teams are successful teams. You have likely heard this. Um, if you're in, an, in the business of open source where there's money involved, if you've got a diverse team, you're going to make more money. You're going to have more successful uh, um, uh, problems that you're solving and, and just generally more success. That's, it's, a, it's a proven data fact out there. Um, but on top of that, it's actually just more efficient to have a lot more different thinkers 
there's different minds looking at the work that you're trying to solve. Um, if, if it's all the same people, you're going to put out the same stuff. Um, uh, kind of boring, kind of kind of lackluster. Get, get diverse out there and, and, and actually be creative with your problem solving. Um, another thing I wanted to point out is that people for often from um, underrepresented or systemically oppressed backgrounds, um, and that's a, a wide breadth of things, the LGBTQI plus community, different racial or um, ethnic or uh, religious backgrounds, um, or just dis disabled folks, um, they're often um, not willing to take up roles in leadership because of those systemic issues, and your project can be the difference in that. You can be open up, and a great, great example that you often see in, in, uh, in job descriptions is that um, there'll be a call out to say, hey, we encourage folks from X community, Y community to apply. We encourage people from the LGBTQI plus community to, to come and talk to us, and you can do those same things to encourage that diversity. Um, and finally, Open Source is Global, have that reflected in your project. Um, it's not just a Berlin Dear Air project. It's not just a, where are you from Vancouver project. It's not just a Sydney via Croatia um, you know, project. So it's really something that uh, being global in this way is going to open up not only the contributor path, but also the way that you solve problems and hopefully build for a global community. So as a bit of an ending note, um, you out there in the audience may be thinking, but I work or I'm a contributor on something which is nowhere near as large as Kubernetes um, because Kubernetes is the outlier statistically for open source by having you know thousands of maintainers. Most projects are under five, realistically. Um, so I wanted to end off with kind of advice for smaller projects because you may be looking at this thinking, we don't have the people to do any of this. And that is absolutely legitimate. But there are still things that you can do that can improve the contributor experience for people who are not you. Um, first off, my favorite piece of advice, think small. Tagging good first issues and fleshing out uh, issue descriptions is an incredibly important thing to do. Um, it's not enough to tag a good first issue. So I was. I helped a project uh, that we sponsor here at Ivan uh, called CLAW. They're a data governance tool for Kafka. Um, and they were doing fantastic. They were tagging their good first issues. Love that for them. But they were tagging good first issues that had issue titles along the lines of fix Flexbox and no issue description, or an issue description that maybe showed a screen cap of the inspector saying, Flexbox isn't working now, and now we need to, see to um, fix Flexbox. And that's not enough for a new first contributor. They are terrified of you. They are terrified of you because it's happening out in the open, and if they make a mistake, there's a chance somebody might laugh at it, and ultimately, we're all humans. Um, so I had a long conversation with them around, what would you need if you were a junior developer who really has zero context on this project? And that's the level you kind of have to think at, is if you're asking for new contributions, again, this is kind of a random person from the internet sometimes, um, or it's somebody in your company who maybe doesn't really know what this project is, um, you need to flesh it out for them. Because fixing Flexbox, if you're a front-end developer, is actually not that hard. But, fix it, but fixing Flexbox in a project that you don't really know how it works and you don't know what the correct acceptance criteria for that would be, that's terrifying. I personally wouldn't do it. I wouldn't want to screw up. Um, Second, think about hiring. Uh, this is my drum that I beat at every open source talk that I give, which is the roles that get staffed on open source projects are the roles that somebody pays for. Um, a question I got a lot when I was at the CNCF is, how do I attract documentation contributors to my projects? And my answer always was, you need to talk to your hiring manager. Whoever hired you has the power to hire a documentation person. They have the power to hire program managers. They have the power to hire community managers. Um, and some organizations do and some organizations don't. Um, so think about if you have a hiring manager that you're working with, think about what kinds of roles you really want to see. Um, think about what your project really needs, because sometimes it's not a developer. Um, think about project velocity and merge velocities. Um, people want to know that if they open a PR, it's going to get merged in some timely fashion. Um, so. It's really nice if you can to document things like we review the PRs weekly. Um, you will always get a response. Um, we expect that you will implement any changes we request before we merge them dot. Um, because there's nothing worse than putting a bunch of work into something to putting a bunch of work into finding a bug and fixing it and the pain that that sort of entails to open a PR upstream to a project and they never come back to it. Um, that sucks. 
write it down, let people know so that they know what to expect. Um, third and final is think about making yourself available in real time. Um, Office hours are a fantastic way of spending one of your hours per week to interface with people who are actually using your thing. Um, and that has a lot of different benefits. One is it builds your credibility in the community because when you build relationships with those people, you can use their stories to promote your project. And projects that have adoption get more adoption. It's a snowball. Um, so think about making yourself available in real time. I'm getting the 10 minute mark, which is fantastic because we're done. Thank you so much. Uh, this is where you can find us on social media. And uh, we have, do have 10 minutes, so we're actually also open to answering any questions that you might have as well. Got a great one second. So, firstly, thank you very much for an awesome talk. Um, as somebody that has gone through this problem um, in a very, very big open source project, which still is around today, kind of, um, how do you encourage recognition for people that do provide this kind of work? Super great question. Uh, I want to jump in with my first answer being that on the Kubernetes side, uh, we, I mentioned um, the uh, contributor summit that we have twice a year, and we actually organize awards yearly specifically for that, where we call out um, contributors that are nominated but per special interest group. So we put it in the group's hands to say, who are the people that you want to highlight and, and, and nominate for that? But that's the scale of Kubernetes in terms of awards where we can fund a cool trophy or something. Actually, I, not to brag, but I got an award once where we actually had a really, really cool plaque made with, um, uh, we all got our own constellation kind of put on this amazing plaque with our name and our, our special interest group that we, we were nominated by. Um, and little things like that, tokens like that of um, investment in this way um, really helped boost not only those contributors, but others who were thinking about making the step to be like, I could be recognized like that one day. So that's definitely one example that has been awesome. Yeah, and I would say that the other thing to think about is that recognition doesn't necessarily need to be a reward. So we had the one um, slide about documenting your roles in open source, and we touched on it a little bit. Um, but so the person who implemented that is a guy called Stephen Augustus. He's a very lovely man. Uh, and one of his big reasons for documenting all these roles in the release team was those are things that people can put on their resumes. They can say, I led a Kubernetes release in this role, and I had these specific responsibilities. Um, particularly for a larger open source project, you can confer power from the project to the individual, and the individual can then have something useful that they take away from the project itself. Um, this is especially important for non-technical contributors, I think, because if they don't have titles, there's unfortunately a bit of an attitude problem that some development communities have where they view that as lesser than. But if you give somebody the title to say, this is this team's project manager, this is this team's community manager, this is the lead of our contributor experience working group, um, that confers a level of respect that can equalize the playing field and again, can serve them later in their careers. Yeah, one thing we're also doing um, um, investigating the Kubernetes project is we're trying to work with GitHub to also create badges specifically for our project as well. And I find that, for lack of a better term, this gamifying of these kinds of things is also really useful where, um, you know, linking up to the platform that you generally use to try and create something like this, um, specifically in the retiring and unretiring um, example that we listed where someone can show what they had contributed in the past and it doesn't go away just because they need to stop and step away from that contribution too. Um, and so, uh, given that we've been able to speak to Kubernetes, um, uh, sorry, Kubernetes has been able to speak to GitHub about creating something like that, I don't doubt that smaller projects will be able to do something similar and, and kind of kickstart a conversation about what's a, a general contribution like badge, for lack of a better term, that can be created in the same way. Questions? Just one here. Sorry. Thank you both for a really interesting presentation. Um, I have a question on this topic of titles. So earlier you mentioned um, giving people the room to define their own role can be something empowering and give them credibility within the project. Um, and I'm wondering how, if you're open to sharing, each of you decided how to define your own roles within the projects you've been a part of, or if you have any other really interesting examples of how other people defined their non-code um, roles. Yeah, I'll start with it. 
Uh, short answer, organically and with a little bit of pain. So um, I will give an example of a friend of both of ours, um, Lori, because again, my, my entry into open source was a little unusual in that I was hired by the Linux Foundation to do the work that I did. That is not most people's paths. Um, <laughs> So our, our lovely friend Lori eventually became the uh, program manager of SIG Release. Um, and she started by showing up. Um, she attended meetings for SIG Release. Uh, she kind of lurked in the background. I think she started to see that they really had some program management problems that needed solving. Um, and by showing up, by doing the work, by being the person who volunteered to say, I'll do that, I'll do that, I'll do that, like yeah, sure, I'll help out with the enhancement proposal process. Um, eventually, people started to realize that there was a certain area of responsibility that she had kind of staked out as useful. Um, and the role evolved organically after that because she sort of became known to the special interest group's leads who said, you're doing amazing work. Now, how do we make it a little bit more official? Um, I mean, open source is kind of an organic thing to begin with in that regards. Um, I have found myself at the helm of uh, certain projects, uh, one called like the Inclusive Naming Initiative. Um, and that happened somewhat organically too. It's, we decided we wanted to do something about words like master and slave and it snowballed and it snowballed and it snowballed. Yeah, it just sort of happens that way. <laughs> um, another example I wanna give is um, generally like this idea of like how our titles came about. Uh, so um, I'm the, I'm the co-chair of SIG Docs and, and, and what I basically did after showing up um, is, is show consistency in that showing up. So the showing up isn't just like a one-time thing and then all of a sudden you're kind of given X title, but, I, but it very much is going to meetings um, and, and taking part in the way that made sense for me, whether that, that is via PRs, which is that at first, especially on a lot of the docs, um, but also then via you know sharing my opinion and um, whether that's um, in meetings with voice or like in the Slack groups as well, like figuring out what your communication style is and like where that's gonna fit is, is, is really worthwhile. Um, and then with that consistency, when the um, opportunity arose to um, put in a whole new bunch of co-chairs because the old one was burnt out, um, I just kind of put my hand up and they were like, yes, we've seen you around, we see your contributions, we want to accept that you, your hand is kind of raised and, and ready for this role. So it was very much, um, and then I had to do six months worth of a bunch of work to do that too. So um, it was very much the consistency aspect in terms of eventually to that title. Um, and uh, what you need to do is define what that consistency means to you first so that you can show that to the project. That, that would be the first step. I've got one question behind you, I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, hey, thanks for the presentation. I had more questions, but you answered most of them during the talk. So I'm left with one. And it's about the slide where like 25% of time is spent writing code. And uh, yeah, I feel it's true, but as a software engineer, it's like uh, kind of native in my brain that my job is about writing code and how to get out of this mindset and uh, think about that's the 10 Slack messages on asking for help or uh, another documentation stuff is as, just as important and how to help other contributors to also uh, get this mind shift about it. Yeah, that's look. That's a great question because um, you know I manage a lot of software engineers and I tell them I tell them all the same thing. The the higher you progress up in your career as an engineer, let's say to principal or distinguish, the less code you will write. Like that is I, I think a universal kind of thing depending on what you're working on. And so what are you filling your time with the rest of the time as you progress in your career? You're filling it with mentorship. You're filling it with design. You're filling it with learning a lot from industry to be able to give your very, very valid, valid um, and senior opinion on things. Um, you're doing it to lightly push back on certain suggestions and give reasons why and, and, and look for data and information to give a yes or no answer. Um, I think uh, if, if you, it, it, no one is going to say, oh, you're not coding a lot of the time, but you're involved in all of these discussions that leads to code being written. Like that's, if you're thinking about it in this kind of aspect, then you're not really going to be thinking you're doing less code because a lot of what you're contributing does mean code in the end. It just doesn't come from nowhere. So if you think more about the holistic life cycle of software, not just your cog in the machine, hopefully that helps you break out of that a little bit of, I have 10 Slack messages to look at, but I have to write all this and make sure it compiles today. Etc. So um, think about it a bit more holistically. There's going to be days where you code a lot and days you code not at all. And that's completely okay too. So very quickly, because we are at five minutes. Um, 
all of the things, your 10 Slack messages, that's a job. Um, and if we sort of look through this slide, this building new features, that's a job. It's called software developer. Bug reports and fixes, that's a job. It's called QA. Proactively managing technical debt, that's a job. It's called project management. Documentation, that's a job. It's called, it's called technical writer. It's called developer relations. Guiding the project's strategic direction, that's a job. Principal engineer. Uh, reviewing contributors, that's a job. Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and when you start to think of these as jobs with distinct skill sets that have value and worth, that's the other half of it. They are not worth more than code. OK. And on that. I think we can do one more question. And this gentleman was up first, unless you. I've got one more at the back, too. OK, one more at the back, and then we're set. Thank you. What's the right way to think about the gender disparity between uh, coders and non coders? Uh, how much time you got? <laughs> OK. Um, uh, yeah, uh, look, uh, that might have to be something we talk about after. The, after. But, uh, but I mean, uh, so, so gender disparity, and, and there's, uh, I, I want to just put it out there, there's more than two genders, because obviously this is a, this is a very, pro we're a very progressive uh, couple of people. Um, but the gender disparity part is actually something where it's part of that big systemic issue of, uh, it goes back to, oh, uh, in my opinion, you know, this kind of work is very, very valuable and, you know, systems of patriarchy means that, okay, it goes like this and how do we kind of push that aside? Um, uh, one, of it, one of those, one of the e easy solutions in terms of like addressing that um, is, is just out, outwardly saying that you're actively trying to have parity, like, and, and aim for that as much as you can in your project. And outwardly say it, call yourselves out on it. Because I think, um, as a woman, I am more willing to join a project that is openly saying, hey, we have a lot of X type of people and we're looking to do more, have, uh, have more X people, and we want that help. Not everyone wants to be the first. Maybe folks like Celeste and I may be, but not everyone, and so that's not going to be a silver bullet, but it's something you can actively do to call out, I'm part of the problem and want to be a solution. Aha, aha, the fact that you have two women up here talking about non-technical contributions, that's legitimate. Um, how do I put it this way? I don't think it's necessarily a problem for women to do the quote unquote non-technical work. Um, I think the real problem is that maybe it's only the men doing the technical work. Does that make sense? I think you need to flip the problem on its head. Um, I have met many, many, many female uh, and non-traditional gender conformity um, people who would love to take more leadership in open source and feel that they have been shut down. So my real question would be, how do you start to lift those people up? And this is where, um, this is where the actions of increasing diversity and inclusion and equity in a project start to get really difficult for some people and for some audiences. Because the reality is you have to try twice as hard to lift those people up as you would like a straight male white engineer. Like you have to find them, you have to mentor them, you have to spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with them. Um, and you have to let them know that they can do it even though it doesn't feel like they can. Um, so that's my opinion on it. Do you have any other thoughts? I think we're at time. But okay, we're at time. <laughs>